I think it's so easy for us to use analogies as humans. Yeah. And an analogy for me is just um, how I'm learning to love Nina. Mm -hmm. That like, I, and I, I, it's so funny because as I grow in my desire to love her more perfectly, I recognize more how imperfect my love for her is. <laughs> Welcome to Beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission. My name is Dan Dimite. I am joined here in the Damascus studio, the illustrious Damascus studio, with my good friends, Brad Pieron and Aaron Richards. Yes, sir. What's going on? Today is going to be a day, friends. I wonder, mm -mm. I have to go back to this yeah. episode. I want to know how woo woo sounds on radio. Good, yeah, well, I'll tell you yeah. what, that throwback mug looks really good oh, on Oh, yeah, radio. this is an old school vintage <laughs> mug. There's yeah. only like two of them left They're around amazing. here. They're my favorite. Yes. We, it. uh Yeah, so if this is your first time uh, joining us for Beyond Damascus, as I said, this is a show where encounter meets mission, which basically our heart is to allow the encounter with Jesus God to propel us into a life with mission. We mm -hmm. don't imagine the early uh, martyrs and the apostles and the church fathers sitting on their couches uh, eating potato chips. No, friends, they that when they encountered the realism of the gospel, they lived missionary lives. And that's what we have to do today yeah. as missionary disciples. So, okay, our episode today is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a little bit of uh, some fun with uh, Teresa Vavila um, mm. and Catherine Siena and some of the mystics. And um, so before we jump into... Uh, this episode, who wants to open us in prayer? <laughs> We've been doing this recently. Yes. I'll go ahead and open us in rock, prayer paper, so we don't scissors, have to. Rock, paper, scissors. No, I, uh, this should just be the prayer seat. This oh, will be the, the prayer, prayer seat. Hey, that's there. good. There so go. for those of you watching, you'll now know that this is the from seat now on, <laughs> where prayer we know who's will opening happen from. In prayer. <laughs> and then the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for all the ways that you bless us and thank you for bringing us to yourself. We pray today, Lord, that in the same way that you worked in the mystics' lives to be more real than real, that you would be so real to us today, that you would bring us into your reality so we can live from that reality in the world today. Let us encounter you in new ways through the words spoken here today and let us live differently as we move forward so that we can allow our encounter with you to lead to real life mission where others are impacted. And it's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Awesome. So if I can um, set us up for the show today, we're going to be talking about why do we follow Jesus? Okay. Mm, it's a pretty simple yeah. topic. Um, but uh, I want to first start just with some fun um, amusement, my friends. Mm -hmm. What? Who is your favorite mystic? When you think mm -hmm. of the mystics, who who are you like? Mm, that's 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 my that's my that's my mystic, Doctor Stephen Strange. <laughs> ah, no, that, tell me more. That doesn't even count, <laughs> Doctor <laughs> Stephen Strange. He's the master of the mystic arts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, I, I am having a really hard time with Marvel nowadays. There's mm. like way too many dimensions in like multi-universe. I, yes. I can't handle that. It's a that. real life the, Russian nesting doll. Right it's like term, which, which degree are we at and I, how much smaller yeah, is it? I want one universe, one dimension. I want, thi well, not one dimension, just one I universe. I want one dimension. I want a white piece of paper with a stick figure we on it. Yeah. Yeah. We celebrated the Feast of Christ the King. The, so the actual term for the Feast of Christ the King is Feast of Jesus Christ, King of the Universe. Yeah, mm -hmm. the sovereign King of the Universe, isn't and, uh, it? Oh, let's just I, went keep to, I went up to Father Dury after Mass, and I was like, so, Father Dury, if if the multiverse ends up being a real thing, mm -hmm. will the title just be automatically changed? <laughs> or will he have to, like, apply for King it? of the Multi... <laughs> And what, yeah, we, sovereign king of the multiverse. Yeah, <laughs> he actually, Father Dury, uh, referred me to a scholarly teaching from some amazing priest disproving the multiverse. Well, hey, you have successfully I don't know if, I don't know if I derailed I don't this know episode, I... Aaron. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, my real yes, favorite yes, mystic. Who's is, your real favorite mystic? I mean, Doctor Strange is my my cool. real favorite mystic is David. <laughs> da mm. the, David the the king uh, the king David the shepherd king. Nice. Okay, explain yeah. why. I, I don't know. Once it, again, just derailing the <laughs> with an unexpected answer. But and the I like how your answer is. I don't know. Go for it, Dave. No, I wasn't. I I don't know whether David qualifies as a mystic or whether that's like you have to have a title for a mystic in the church. I don't know either. Um, I I love I love the Psalms. Uh, both as a reflection of his prayer and as an insight into just the way that he sees God. Um. 
I see, I see the way that the way that David prayed. I mean, the way that the Psalms are taught are that like this is the this is the prayer for the church. This is the prayer for for all generations. Yeah. And uh, and so many so many beautiful aspects into the person of Jesus that came from a man who existed thousands of years before his birth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. When I think of the mystics, I usually jump to the Spaniards, you know, John mm. of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, but I, I don't know as much about either of them as I would desire. So I know some of their like major works, you know, um, the one who stands out to me when I think mystic, and again, to Aaron's question, I'm not sure if he is officially constituted as one, but Padre Pio that the life that he lived was such a mystical life that you can so clearly see in the life of Padre Pio that he was living through the thin veil, which is really what I would define mysticism as, right? Is that he was seeing into a different reality and, and really trying to bring that reality here. And that's what's so amazing because he's such a modern saint. You can like literally see him celebrate mass and it looks as if he's looking into something else. You know, it's like the way he celebrated mass was like, you're you're just somewhere else, yeah. in the, but 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 I'm there with you, and I don't know what to do. You know, it's uh it's cool because I think the mystics serve um, the church in such a very um, particular and specific way, in the sense that they like, almost to a heightened degree, whereas like a religious dresses a certain way to constantly remind us that heaven is real. Mystics like live in the way that just proclaiming heaven is real, you know, like, <laughs> like Padre Pio, like even some of those like supernatural gifts, you know, like, like levitation and things like that. He, he is in a place that's not adhering to the same things we see around us day to day. And that, that calls us deeper. So Padre Pio, I have a huge devotion uh, to him. And, uh, but yeah, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, like that, obviously the church is um, riddled with amazing saints. I used yeah, to be really scared of John of the deck. Cross uh, too. <laughs> And the last yeah. the last few years in formation, I've had opportunity to to dive in and, mm-hmm. and reflect on and speak on a lot of his teaching. Yeah, um, and he's awesome. I think the key for John of the Cross is if being able to find someone who can translate him really good for you. Right? That it seems like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. all this poetry is like super hard and confusing. I I, I can't yeah. handle John of the Cross. But when you when you understand someone who has like mm-hmm. a scholar that breaks yeah. down John of the Cross for you, it be, mm-hmm. he he becomes much less complicated yeah. and yeah. scary, if you will. Well, the spiritual canical is so powerful, yeah. and then also like I think. A lot of times, well, actually, first, if you're listening today, Fire Within by Thomas Dubé is yeah. amazing, and it talks about both of those mystics. But I also think it, it needs to be brought to our level sometimes, because sometimes I'm, and I don't even mean in an intellectual way, but just in an experiential way. Like, sometimes I was always, um, sometimes, not always, I was sometimes convinced that John of the Cross was, like, speaking things, like, antithetical to the way of Catholicism I was living at the time. And then I started reading him, and I'm like, nope. Actually, all of this lines up exactly. Like he's encountering the Lord in all these amazing ways. And what he's saying is the person of Jesus is actually even better than the experiences we have with him. And that's totally correlated to all the things we teach here and everything I found in the charismatic renewal. So anyway, that would be my- I'm a huge fan Ruth. of Bernard of Clairvaux. Oh man, um, good old uh, man, or Bernard, uh, if the, you will. There's the Frenchman. Yeah, uh, I Clairvaux. Just, I, I like how he. Um, Bernard well, is not the French pronunciation <laughs> at all. I don't know. There's 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 debate. Uh, actually, <laughs> <No> debate. <laughs> that's the French way of of pronouncing his name. No, I like, was <laughs> I was I was I was doing. You can go back a few episodes, but there was a interview uh, we were doing with Beyond Damascus, and I kept calling him Bernard of Clairvaux, and the other one was like, well, I've heard it's Ber- Bernard. And I'm like, I don't care. It's, 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 it's this guy. I'm getting Clairvaux, Clairvaux. right. Okay. V-A-U-X yeah, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah I'm for, getting for Clairvaux. All my energy went. <laughs> Clairvaux. I am clear that Clairvaux is correct. Yeah, you guys, I always love when you're in a conversation with someone. And it's smarter like, than you? Well, no, well, I mean, well, those yeah, all of the time. Daily. So. But like, it's like you're talking about one thing, like one saint, and they're talking about the total opposite, like Teresa of Avila versus like Teresa, the little flower, yeah, right? Like, yeah. or, like it always yeah. like, okay, how do I help them understand we're on different <laughs> pages right now? Or like you have Teresa of Lassoo, right? Teresa of Lassoo, who is, um, 
uh, often is referred to as like uh, Teresa of the, what is it? The Holy face of Jesus. And then, yeah. um, and then Teresa of Avila also is of the, what she also has this title. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure what I it forget. is. So there's the Holy face of Jesus. And then there's like the heart of Jesus or something. It's just like, <laughs> see, this is why it's so complicated. Um, yeah. But anyway, I like Bernard because uh, he was, um, he he had an active life and a, a and a deeply contemplative life, right? And it's so so refreshing to know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, this guy set up like monasteries and convents all over the place. Like he was getting stuff done, and mm-hmm. um, the the active life and the contemplative life can go hand in hand. And one of my favorite things was mm-hmm. uh, a quote of his, and, and uh, Thomas Dubay writes about this in in one of his other books. Um, I, I think it's called. Um, deep conversion, deep mm-hmm. prayer. And he talks about how uh, ben- Bernard kind of stands in front of his monks. And these, like, these are guys who have given their lives completely over to Jesus, right? Like I I'll feel give like, up everything. Yeah, I think and they've made Jesus. pretty intense steps <laughs> at this point. And he, he kind of chastises them for their lukewarmness and their spiritual plateau. Mm-hmm. And he says, there are far more men who go from being bad to good than there are those who go from being good to great. And, this 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 idea of so often we 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 go through the work of our initial conversion to go from bad to good and then we stop there and we don't do the work to for that second conversion to trans mm-hmm. um, to if, if you will to transform us into Christ Jesus to be transformed from good to great and mm-hmm. um, and he was really kind of chastising the spiritual complacency the spiritual plateauing and this need to to work towards uh, and to be worked on towards greatness and mm-hmm. and I think you know we talk about this a lot at Damascus of like man so often we make the measuring stick the world as opposed to Jesus right like so. If in my daily Christian life, I'm comparing myself to everyone else Mm -hmm. in the world, then I'm doing pretty good, right? Like, and it's very easy to paint the the world as like Mm -hmm. pure evil, right? So then Mm -hmm. it's even like, I'm doing really good compared Mm -hmm. to everyone Mm -hmm. else, right? Or where we make the measuring stick, the, the other Catholics, even in the church, like, mm-hmm. well, mm, I'm better than the CEO Catholics, right? Christmas, mm-hmm. Easter only Catholics. I'm better than, uh, I, I'm better than the, the rest in, in my parish. Mm-hmm. Like I'm far, I'm mm-hmm. faring pretty well. I yeah. volunteer for a lot. I'm sharing the gospel, um, as opposed to making, you know, Jesus, our measuring right. stick. And mm-hmm. when I measure myself against the world, I look great. Right. Mm-hmm. But when I measure myself against Jesus, who I'm actually called to become as a mm-hmm. a, as a, a, a a disciple, as a Christian, um, man, I, I just keeps I, you humble. it keeps you humble. It does. Like, well, yeah. And I tell the missionaries that a lot is that there's there's two people that are appropriate to compare ourselves to. The first is ourselves yesterday, and the second is Jesus today. Right? That like I want to be better than I was yesterday, not out of some vain glory pursuit, but because that's that's what happens in the spiritual journey yeah. is, is each day I, I want to be more like the one that I'm trying to conform to. And then today I want to compare myself to the way that Jesus would live in my shoes today, right? All mm. other comparison in my life should be to complete me. Like I, I, I'm not the same in knowing you, Dan, and you, Aaron, yeah. that I would be not knowing you. It doesn't mean I need to become you. It means that there's a part of you that teaches me a part of me. Yeah. And like, I, I do think Christianity, we fall to that all of the time, that, that our measuring stick becomes, like, it's funny, I don't even know why this is coming to mind, but like sports video games, they have like an overall rating system, you know, like, like I don't even know what the lowest is, I think it's like 60, but like 60 to 99 overall, you know? And I'm like, well, I'm kind of like an 88 overall, that's pretty good, like I would be a starting player on most of the lineups here, you know? And it's like, <laughs> yeah. it is just not a grading system like that at all. It, it's much more... Um, well, I guess it's twofold. It's finding that the, the chasm between me and Jesus is as infinite as everyone else's. And then it's the humility of that with the hunger of, yet I can still increase dramatically day over day. Yeah, yeah. But, it's funny comparing yourself with Jesus too. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those beautiful experiences of entering directly into something that's impossible. Yes. Like a mystery mm-hmm. that, Good. okay, so yeah, mm-hmm. when I compare myself to Jesus, I don't even register on the chart. Right. Yet he says I'm worthy. Yes. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yet, yet he gives me all the responsibility of doing mm-hmm. all of his stuff. Yeah. So it's, 
it's a both and. Yes, they're not definitely. even they're not even on the same. No, spectrum. well, he transcends my inadequacy too. Like his promise is it's 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 the incarnation in our lives that Jesus is like. You know that chasm between heaven and you all on earth. <laughs> I'm actually going to become human. So as to actually be both sides of the promise. And like, it's the same here. It's like, yeah, if I just look as if like I'm on this side of the ocean and he's over there, but he walks across the ocean to me and brings me across with him, you know? And there's, the, both, it's mystery. Both infinitely it's both. large it is, it, and in, in, inconsequential. <laughs> no, that's exactly the way to say it. But again, like, I do think that's what Bernard, or Bernard, I'm now, I'm now, I'm See? screwed up. I'm screwed it's up. Hard. I'm, I usually say Bernard, but I'm also from Portsmouth, so I mispronounce yeah. things yeah. regularly. You also call them cricks. <laughs> yes, that's and, true. And rough. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> well, no, I won't go there, but there's yeah. uh, a lot of things, and you'll pick up over time if you listen to our <laughs> podcast that I pronounce incorrectly, but I do think, um, Bernard, I think he does point to these realities. I think, again, I think that's what the mystics do for us, is they suggest this exact reality, that there's mystery here amongst yeah. us, They're, the heavenly reality is here now yeah. and it's around us and, and we can press into that. Well, and, and the, the spiritual journey is one in which we can never spiritually plateau. Right. And that's, that's the, the, if you will, the definition of mystery in the ch- life of the church is something that is inexhaustible. And, and so mm-hmm. even in heaven, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. I can meditate on the Trinity and I can be in the love of the Trinity in heaven. Mm-hmm. And yet that mystery is inexhaustible. It'll yeah. never, I'll never be like, I get it. Uh-huh. I get it. You know, like yeah, the, that's good. the the clover's not enough. Yeah. And um and and I think that is this mystery of our own transformation into Christ Jesus is it, it's mind boggling, right? That, that he gave me his spirit and his spirit <laughs> lives in me. And the spirit that lives in me is in, is, is transforming me into another Christ, right? That, that as Paul says, it's no longer I who lives, but mm-hmm. Christ who lives in me that, Holiness is this transformation of becoming mm-hmm. Christ, and mm-hmm. and I I think it's such a it, it it is humbling. It's it's wild that man he's 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 called me to to this reality that I, yeah I don't compare myself to the world. Mm-hmm. I compare myself to him, and it's not a a comparison where I'm like oh I'm not good enough. It's that as you said, Aaron, he's chosen us, and it's like okay, Lord help continue to transform me. Yeah. And so this is the mystics do something, the mystical tradition of the church. They talk about these three stages of conversion and we could actually have a whole episode on the three stages, which would be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, we should, but the there's purgative, illuminative and unitive, right? And the soul journeys uh, through these stages of conversion and the purgative stage is like uh, uh, the, the time of repentance from sin, right? And purifying ourselves from our, egocentricness and, um, and the, the, you know, some of the mystics refer to this as like being at the feet of Jesus where we're, we're like, well, him crucified and we're weeping and we're crying. Um, but, um, and they call this like a slavish love where we love God, um, out of fear for hell, right? Like in, in sure. our initial conversion, a lot of times we, we choose God maybe because we we're afraid of hell or we choose to, uh, to live virtuously because we want to go to heaven and we're afraid of hell. It's just like almost a slavish love. The loss of heaven and the pains of hell. Yeah, right. Like, exactly. And the yeah. church even has language around that. Yeah, that yeah. We're actually that. Yeah. That's a first step. Yeah. And, and so when the soul moves from the purgative phase into the illuminative phase, so in the, if you will, in the spiritual journey, we're moving away from slavish love. Of, but in the illuminative phase, like the soul still has, as the mystics say, this imperfect love, right? That hmm. uh, it's a love that um, it is still covered with um, selfish motivation or impure uh, egocentric motives. And then the soul, as, as we overcome imperfect love, we move into the unitive phase of conversion, which is perfect love. And in perfect love, it's not that we're in love with God, right? But we're actually in in the love of God. And mm-hmm. so why is mm-hmm. it, as you speak of Brad, that veil is so thin. It's not because the soul is just in love with God, but you're actually in the love of the blessed Trinity, which is uh, such an amazing, like, yeah, uh, yeah. and, um, and the, and so today I kind of thought it'd be fun to just reflect on this idea of why do we follow Jesus and really look at this mm-hmm. notion that Catherine and Teresa mm-hmm. talk about of imperfect love. Um, that, it, that in order to have deep union with Christ, he not only wants me to overcome my sinfulness, and, um, but he wants me to have, he wants me to overcome my imperfect love. Um, what comes to your guys' mind initially when I speak of this idea of imperfect love? 
Yeah. The first thing that comes to my mind is the, um, well, just because I still think uh, now being two years into marriage, just, uh, I think it's so easy for us to use analogies as humans. Yeah. And an analogy for me is just um, how I'm learning to love Nina. Mm -hmm. That like, I, and I, I, it's so funny because as I grow in my desire to love her more perfectly, I recognize more how imperfect my love for her is. Mm -hmm. It's it's bizarre like that, right? It's this like I'm noticing this desire, and I'm like, whoa! Like I'm still selfish here. Yeah. Like I'm actually loving her so that we don't argue as much because that would bring me less anxiety, right? I, I don't even know if that's a real. You can see what I'm saying though. I'm building up like this understanding in this season of you hear our that, Nina? walk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, <laughs> Nina's amazing, and, and and like we we could we might want to do that sometime, but just like. Um, she, it's really amazing the way that she partners with me and, and is so merciful with me in that process. And she allows me to be honest in it too. And that's been huge for me where I'm like, Nina, like, I want you to know that I'm loving you the best I know how right now, but I am realizing that I don't yet know how. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a really cool <laughs> place because it leaves me, um, we, maybe we overuse that word. It leaves me somewhat dependent. It, it, it leaves me not anxious to find it in myself because I know that like, I mean, I, I need something that transcends me because yeah. even, even in the most selfless act I have, I can see where, man, I'm, I'm still kind of banking on the residual effects of that. Yeah. I'm still banking on the peace that should come from me being good. I'm still banking on the fact that you could do that one thing that I like around the house because I did this one thing I like even very subtly. So that's the first thing that comes to my mind when I think imperfect love is something like that, where the, the, um, most meaningful pursuit I have in my life in Nina, as I go farther into that pursuit, I recognize the imperfections and I, I, I don't want to jump the gun, but it's yeah. sim similar to what Avila says when raising a glass to a light, you know, like and when I look at a wine glass right here, I don't see any spots on it. It seems clean. As I raise it more and more to the light, it's like, whoa, there's spots all over it because it's like, it's ascending as it was down here, but as it gets closer, you're just noticing different details. So that, that's what comes to my mind. I think of the microcosm of family uh, as well. Two things come to mind. So, you know, Nice use of the word microcosm, by the way. <laughs> yeah. No, it's real. Both in my marriage as well yeah. uh, with, with Monica and then, and then even seeing the way that I love my kids and that they love each other. Um, you, you know, you'll find no better explanation of imperfect love. Than, <laughs> like, I love you as I'm hitting you or... <laughs> Not not me to my children, them, yeah. them to one another. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it it's just you know how how in the context of family, like you can be mm -hmm. in a place where you're on each other's nerves and also committed to seeing each other grow and succeed. And, yeah. Um. So it, it is. It's 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 beautiful. It's beautiful to live in the midst of that mess. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a I had a great human moment this weekend where I had to go and apologize to my kids for losing my temper over tracking mud into the house, you know, silly, stupid, meaningless thing. And it's just like, this is, this is so good to be able to like expose and demonstrate what it's like to, to not have my crap together all the time. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. I think it's funny because in, in the relationship and marriage and family. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's two imperfect people trying to love each other. Yeah. And so I think the mutual imperfection creates all kinds of interesting scenarios. And in our, in our pursuit for God, it's the imperfect pursuing the perfect and, and better put the perfect pursuing the imperfect. And um, which yes. is, it's, it's funny because it's an analogy, but it ultimately is an imperfect analogy as well. Yeah, right. And um, imagine that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The best analogy hmm. I could come up with was also imperfect. Yeah. But it is, I mean, this idea of spousal love and the mystics, when they speak yeah. of this unitive phase, the, the purgative, illuminative, unitive, it's, mm -hmm. they, they, they refer to it as spousal love. Yeah. That we can't even, we can't even describe what our love for God will be like in heaven because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and spousal loves the best we can do, but really, truly it does, yeah. it does, does not compare mm -hmm. to what it can mm -hmm. be. And, 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 and it's probably why you see such an explosion of incredible like gifts and grace when people get to that spousal love yes. with the Lord. Definitely. Well, I, I have, as you've been reflecting on unitive, uh, on unitive love, it even brings it brings to mind the fact that like the the examples that we have in scripture of spousal love with God. So you see in the in 
the Song of Songs is is traditionally like our our experience of of a an example of spousal love, and even in the context of Scripture, it's it's very very inadequate. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. That the that the the beloved is is woefully unprepared to have <laughs> to have an effective yeah relationship with her spouse. So mm-hmm. it, you know, it's almost one of those things that we step into the Trinitarian mystery. I have to realize that, gosh, I want to I want to work the the rest of my life to understand the beauty mm-hmm. of Trinitarian love and to know that even in heaven, I'm not going to get it. Yeah. Yep. Well, there's a second mystery in it too, right? The mystery of the Immaculate Conception and the like indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That like we actually get the image of what the church perfectly responding to God perfectly creates, right? That Mary, perfect as representative of Mother Church, has Holy Spirit overshadow her. And from that, the conception of of God, yeah. right? Like that that's when God is literally brought into the incarnate word of God, right? Like that's that's the moment of the Difficult hypostatic union. Exactly. <laughs> no, but but like but the, what I'm trying to get out even of the theological jargon there is to to our point, we're talking in the spousal mm-hmm. sense about two imperfect people pursuing each other within the godly sense an imperfect pursuing the perfect or better yet the perfect pursuing the imperfect. But like that's why Catholicism is so beautiful is because we can look to Mary and say, wait, you gave the perfect response to the perfect pursuit. Yeah, man, I, I can kind of contemplate that and think to myself, what would it look like for me yep. to not be selfish and to respond? Like, how can this be? Yep. Like, how can it be that you're doing all these things yep. for good? Yeah. Well, and I think the, so the treasure of the mystics, as they speak of this pursuit of overcoming imperfect love to grow, mm-hmm. to, to, if you will, enter into spiritual marriage. It's, it's this, pursuit of um, not only examining one's actions, which of course in the purgative phase, we're often looking at our actions, right? That we're overcoming our sinful, our sinfulness. We're overcoming uh, our, our, our mortal sins, of course, our venial sins, our willed venial sins. Right. And, um, Mm -hmm. but then uh, here it's, let us look at our, our motives. Right. And um, I think often the spiritual life, especially if we look at being bad to good, good to great, uh, in this measuring stick of the world, we most of the time we evaluate ourselves against the world through our actions, right? And not necessarily our motives. And it's this, this, these actions of, well, I'm better than them because uh, of A, B, C, and D, right? Yeah. And, um, but this uh, reflection on overcoming imperfect love is really an examination of, well, what are our um, unconscious ego, like egotisms, right? Where, mm-hmm. where does my heart desire God, not for God's own sake. Um, the, the imperfect love could be a, a, a love of God for the sake of consolation. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and that's why John of the cross would say desolation can actually be one of the means by which God helps to transform us. Because uh, sometimes the imperfection of my heart may be that I only love God because I really love all the things I get from God, the way yeah. he makes me feel. And, mm-hmm. and that's an imperfect love. It's just, it's, it's selfishness. Right. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. or um, imperfect love. I think a lot of times in the Christian community that we love God because all of our friends are, are in the church. Right. And Mm -hmm. so is it actually love of God for God's sake, or do I follow Jesus because it's my social club and and maybe I still have a prayer life and I still go to mass on Sunday. I'm still involved in mission, but one of my selfish motivations are, well, this is my community Mm -hmm. Um, or the way I feel right. Like that I feel good about myself as a person because I've chosen the better path. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't want to be that person who's in the world and doesn't mm-hmm. go to church on Sunday. So I feel good about it's it's actually <laughs> egocentricism, right? That, that I feel good about myself and uh, I'm better than others because mm-hmm. I've chosen this lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And it's all these forms of um imperfect love yeah. that I don't love God for his own sake, for the sake of the lover. I actually love God for my own sake. Yeah. The one the one that's subtle for me, I wonder what you think about this, Aaron. The one that's even more subtle than those that I'm noticing in my own life is so sometimes it's actually, I, um, those are kind of the selfish ones, right? And again, I, I think those are real in my life, but there's also ones where I have that are like almost, um, um, I don't even know how to say it. They're altruistic in nature, but they're not for the love of God. So it's like, for the sake of a good family that has good order, I love God. Yeah, That's not even for me necessarily. Of, of course, in a roundabout way, it could be, but for those around me. Cause it would be better for them if we all loved God. 
you yep. know? And again, not even saying that that's a bad desire. It's just not all the way, right? Yeah, like, for the sake of a long for the marriage. Sake, the, and for the sake of God, I love God, God's intention. That in the beginning, he created all of us to be with him. And that that's an that's impulse for me for evangelization. Not just because it'll be better for you, but because it completes this whole thing. Like my heart yearns for what God's heart yearns for, and he wants you. You know, like it, it kind of flips evangelization even a little bit where it's, I'm seeking the lost again. Yes. For the lost's sake, but for God's sake, yeah. I'm seeking, I, I'm, I'm seeking the lost. Mm-hmm. Like, like he, cause he desires them yeah. and I'm going out because he desires them. Yes. They desire him too. Yes. Like the whole world is looking for God. There is a good impulse there. But again, even it, you I feel I notice, good when you win the loss. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, like no, that's I want, my point. I want to be the kind of person that lives a life that's yes. bigger than myself. I right? feed the poor. And I so, do the other yeah. things. Again, like and it's that altruistic. Makes me feel yeah, it's yes. altruistic. It makes me feel good that's exactly about it. myself. That's exactly and, it. Yeah. Now again, I'm not. Though we need to just again because you're talking good to great. I'm not here condemning any of those no, things. No, because it was built. I'm in saying you. that those things are like yeah. good for impulse and for good action, and we do need to do good in the world. But and how many times do our even our our words of evangelization have that as their root? Yeah. Yes. Like this is how this is how I'm gonna I'm gonna trick you into becoming. We would, man. I, I notice in myself when I have moments that are like that it's so much more effective. Like people, it's it just like, it's authentic. It cuts through. It's, it's insane. It's like, it's like through hot butter. It's like when you're, when you're in that mode, when you're connected to the Lord, it's like, whoa, that just works. That just happened. What do you think, Aaron? It's, it's one of those both and deals, right? That, that I'm made for this. I'm, I'm never going to be good enough, but gosh, it's, it's good that, uh, it's good that Jesus paints big targets because, um, there's such a there's such a risk as we as we continue to dive into Christian faith of thinking that I've got it figured out. Yeah. And and when I've got it figured out, then that just takes me into a place of control. So if 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 I can control my own Christian experience, if I can control my family, if I can control my marriage, right, then then I'll be happy. And ultimately, like that's the definition of of the demonic. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think, it, yeah, it's so funny because I, I even think of like, I remember when I was going through the Marian consecration the first time mm-hmm. and um, Louis de Montfort kind of talks yeah. about this idea that the soul who is consecrated to, to Mary gives the merits <laughs> and the grace of all of their, their prayer, their too, virtue, yeah. their action. It all goes to Mary so that she can dispense it as she pleases. I right? remember, I remember digging into this with you 20 years yeah. ago. I mean, it was just, and I'm like, what? Like, wait, you're telling me. It's if not I, fair. If I, I remember I, being repulsed like, by it. I do. Especially as a dad, I'm like, I want, I want the, the, uh, 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 like, uh, efficacy of my rosary to be dedicated to my kid's salvation. Listen, I don't God. want to give it to Mary <laughs> yes. and let her do whatever, yeah, whatever, she, whatever wants she wants with yeah. that. Because she'll hold out on me, of course. But, yeah, but when we pray, you know, we pray a, a, a novena, right? Well, why do we sure. pray a novena? Because in faith, we want God to come in power, right? And But yeah. w- there's there can be this uh, uh, motivation that, like, God, give me what I want. And I'm praying because I, I want you to give me what I want, right? Yes. And, and that there's this unconscious selfishness that's involved. And that's why the Marian consecration is so cool. It's like, okay, I'm going to do all of this, Mary, you take it Mm -hmm. and now do Mm -hmm. what you want with it. Mm -hmm. It's like abandoning my own, like the fruit of my own effort. Yeah. I I deal with this with young adults all the time. And um, because as we're recruiting missionaries and things like that, we walk with so many young adults. And, and I think the most common thing in the young adult church today is a, a false understanding of means and end that Jesus is the means almost always in the young adult church today. He's the means to all the things I want in life. So Jesus is the means by which I achieve the end of a good spouse. Yep. He's the means by which I achieve the end of my satisfaction. He's the means by which I achieve the end of greater knowledge than those around me. He's the means by which I achieve the end of greater control over my life. He's the means by which I achieve the end of um, reconciliation in friendships that I want reconciliation in. He's the means, he's the means, he's the means. And I spend almost all of my time listening to respond at the end like, okay, what if we flip this, right? So what if the friendships in my life are actually the means by which I achieve the end of Jesus? What if my pursuit of vocation was actually me asking the question, Jesus, where can I love you the best? 
like it's it's a it's a total paradigm shift. Yep. But the the anxiety that falls away when we see it from that angle is insane. Yeah. Because again, it, what happens is Jesus, if you're the means and the end that I want isn't happening. I'm questioning my relationship with you. Yep. Am I in sin? Is it spiritual warfare? All these things that we talk about relentlessly, you know? Again, there's a place for both of those. Like, it's not a total insult to talking about that. It's, But it, when we switch it, anxiety, freedom. Well, and that flip. is exactly the the process of overcoming imperfect love, right? That when I, I treat sure, yeah. Jesus as a means to an alternative end, hmm. then then ultimately that is imperfect. It's a different love. way of seeing it. Yeah. So if I, thing, I yeah. treat Jesus as yep. the end, I mean, if I treat consolation as the end and Jesus is the means to get the consolation I desire, if, even if it's peace, I have a lot of anxiety in my life and I want peace as the end. Well mm-hmm. then, you no, know, Jesus is the end, right? And there may, there may be things that Jesus brings into our life that don't cause e- e- peace sure. initially, right? To get us to a place where we, cling to him yes. and we have mm-hmm. nuptial yeah. spousal love with him. And mm-hmm. it's, it's the, I think there's, it's almost the difference between Eros and Agape, right? This idea that in marital love, again, there can be Eros and Eros is good and Definitely. important and valuable. Well, like, Benedict goes so far to say that Jesus does love us with an Eros love. It just absolutely. goes farther. And we right? love Jesus with, with an, an Eros, Eros love, love. Yep. and heaven has an Eros love, yep. right? <laughs> like no, I hope no, that no, there's a word. lot of consolation in heaven, <laughs> yeah. right? Like the, the Eros is this, like mm-hmm. I'm in love and I, and I feel the passion. consolation of love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The mm-hmm. passion behind love, all of that. And that gets me into this relationship, right? Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. then once you're in that relationship, there are those moments of agape, of total self-sacrifice where, you know, and I think you guys can experience this. And I know some of my friends who have probably even experienced this more than I have in their marital love. But this idea of when when things press in, right? And marriage or family situations and and things are going really bad, there's something so beautiful about like in the end, you're like, it doesn't matter what is happening and all the sacrifice and the suffering that's going on. I'm here with you. Mm-hmm. And that's, what's so beautiful, right? That yeah. the, the world almost disappears for these saints and these mystics that they can be in this immense amount of physical, emotional, uh, exterior. Like there can be all of this like chaos outside of mm-hmm. them. And yet interiorly they they've got total rest mm-hmm. because they're with the lover. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and that's like this agape self-sacrificial love where I love you for your, for you. Mm-hmm. I just want to be with you. Right. So Catherine kind of or, or speaks of this imperfect love. It's like, like the, the soul is unconsciously seeking itself mm-hmm. and its own good instead of the good of the lover. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that when I asked that first question, why do we follow Jesus? Right. Is it, am I accidentally unconsciously seeking the good of me or am I seeking the good of the lover? And so often when we don't move into mission, I would say it's because the soul is unconsciously seeking itself Mm -hmm. and it's in this flight or fright mode, right? Right, right. I'm Mm -hmm. protecting myself from the bad harm that could come. I don't want to lose my job. I don't Mm want to lose my friends. I don't want to get discouraged. I don't want to feel rejected. All of these things actually prevent me not only from pursuing God, but also from pursuing mission Mm -hmm. for God. Mm -hmm. Do you guys think this is a a place where... um... So I'm just trying to listen through like a, a different, um, I don't know if you listen through lenses, but I'm, I'm just trying to listen with different ears to what we're saying. And I, I wonder like, cause, cause I think a topic like this, you can hear it and go, wow, this is fascinating and probably true, but why exactly does it matter? You know, like why exactly if I'm loving someone in this way versus this way, does it matter? I think the only reason that question can come in the church today is because there's been part of us that have made heaven boring. Like if the end of this, right? So we're saying that unitiv is amazing, right? Like, like the mystics would say, there's nothing you wouldn't do to get to the unitive stage. Like by the time they get to the unitive stage, they're like everything else. Like even Aquinas, right? It's it, it can be presumed that when when he has the beatific vision, that unitive stage, and he goes everything straw, you know, like that's usually like, what happens with yeah, the beatific right, vision. Right, 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 right. So so there's something so profoundly good about that. But I do see, I don't think, and I don't think it's just concupiscence. There's this, there's this part of us that's like, that's awesome. And I'm glad some people are gonna do that. I'm gonna stick with good. And I think there's a part of that because like I I don't know if we talk enough about like the reward. Again, not that it's for the reward, because even that, but like the reward of this is insane. That seeing Jesus as he is, 
him being in your life as he desires to be, it couldn't get better. And it doesn't matter what circumstance you have. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are. It doesn't matter how sick you are, how healed you are. Like if he is in your life, it, it literally, it could it could not be better. And sometimes I, I notice this in youth ministry and I, I, I'll i throw it to you guys, but like in youth ministry, a lot of the kids are like, yeah, this makes sense. These retreats are fun. I don't know about following him and giving up all the other things because those are kind of fun too because we don't know how good the end is because yeah. the end has yeah. no longer been Jesus. And like, yeah. and we don't speak about how good he is. I don't know. There's something, I wonder <laughs> if people listening today and if no one can, that's okay. It could just be a thought experiment for me. But I think you can hear it sometimes and go, is this worth the cost? Yeah. Like there's a lot I'd have to do here. What's the end? Well, the end is, I mean, Jesus, like, but perfectly Jesus in a way that, I mean, I'm just you take it back. I love the the marriage analogy is so beautiful too. Um, mm-hmm. When we we have a we have a lot of marriages happening here at Damascus right now, mm-hmm. and when when I advocate for marriage, when I get excited about marriage, when I when I counsel people and give direction, like I don't I, I don't sit here and talk about hey, would you like to hear about how Monica and I are struggling through this thing, right? Yeah, right. But the the truth is, fifteen years in, like. Those are the moments where where true connection is is found. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And and I see and I see the fruit of that, and I can witness to the value of that. But the words that I have to use sometimes are like just just wait. Yeah. Just wait because it's it's awesome. It's it's more than I could even explain and right now because it's something you've there. got to experience. Yeah. Yes. Right. And and so so why is, why does it matter? Um. Because because. Whether whether you're new to this thing, like whether whether you're stepping into Christian life for the first time, mm-hmm. whether you're engaging in your first Bible study or coming to your first Empower conference, uh, God has God has immeasurably more for you than you can imagine. Yes, and ten years from now, He's going to still have immeasurably more, and, and it's so like, much better. Yes, and, and and that's the thing is you have to trust there though, right? Like it's like okay, um, yeah, the trust piece on this whole like journey because yeah. Well, I think it's uh, the, I think that's the a keen. A, a keen witness, Aaron, that it is those moments of, if you will, deepest suffering that you're often the the closest with your spouse, right? And uh, there's something so purifying about um, suffering that it enables a deeper form of love. And and that's exactly what the mystics say. They 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 the purgative phase is this kiss of the feet. And the unitive phase is the kiss of the lips, right? That if I look at Christ crucified, I want the kiss of the lips and the song of songs. Like, you know, let, let, let my lover kiss me with uh, kisses from his lips. And so I want this, this deep union with him. And the means by which the soul journeys is the kiss of the feet to the kiss of the lips is through the wounded side that they say the, the illuminative phase is when you're at the, the wounded side of Jesus. And it's that people want... Uh, they want spiritual union without passing through the cross, but it's actually l- through the cross, the spiritual union comes, right? That mm. the deepest form of love comes through suffering. And that's yeah. why John of the Cross says, sometimes it's just going to happen. Sometimes the 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 Lord will bring, su- like suffering will uh, will come into our lives and you'll, you'll experience uh, external, uh, yeah. suffering or internal suffering, right? Mm-hmm. The, um, mm-hmm. desolation, f- so that you can be purified to love God for his own sake. And, and I think that to see desolation or suffering from that perspective of, wow, here's, here's a purifying time for me to, to love him for him, as opposed to a prosperity gospel that I get more from him if I love him, you mm-hmm. know, and, um, and to start blaming him for the things going wrong in my life. Yeah. Um, how do, how do we do that? How do we, uh, how do we allow ourselves to find Christ at the end of suffering, if you will? Uh, I think, I think in the, in the way that, in the way that we pray, in the way that we, that we stay committed, um, oftentimes for me, at least it's, it's seeing those things that I depended on begin to fall away. And then, and then just having, like, I'll, I'll describe how I, how I often will, will speak about this. Like it's, it's realizing that, um, I don't have to judge myself by the performance of how my prayer life is going. I don't have to judge myself of my performance mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. how many consecutive rosaries I'm, I'm praying or how many days I've gone without this vice or that vice or, 
or whatever. But, but at the end of the day, like settling into a place where I, I, whether, whether in success or in failure, I look to my, to my, to my right or to my left. And I, I see that like, Jesus, you're with me. Um, you know, I, I, I've been asking in my head over the course of the show, uh, like, okay, in what areas have I ever experienced, you know, unitive love? Mm -hmm. And, and I think, I think it has been in those times when I can describe that, like, I just, I just have a, have a sense beyond a sense that like God is, God is with me. He's walking mm -hmm. with me. He's suffering this with me. He's, he's, mm -hmm. we're, we're together. And yeah. it's, it's almost, uh, you know, my tendency, at least, I don't know if this is others, other people's tendency to, there's a, there's a tendency to describe in a way that's scholarly and intellectual, like an experience of faith. And, um, oftentimes in my deepest moments of connection with Jesus, it's not about my ability to describe anything. It's just like, he's, he's just there. Yeah. He was there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just, we were hanging out. Yeah. Right? Like how, how, how elementary that sounds. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, if I were to lead with that in an, in an evangelization moment, like, Hey bro, like let's, uh, Let's invite Jesus because he's just he's just there. Yeah, like, <laughs> right, right. That's like so flaky. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think it's almost <laughs> the mm -hmm. and I, sometimes things come into our life that that help us. Um, sometimes things come into our life that purify those impure, uh, I mean, those those imperfect motives. Um, and then sometimes you know life may be really good and mm -hmm. there's not anything going on and. And there almost has to be the soul needs to actively mm -hmm. uh, allow myself to do that, right? In the sense of like fasting, like a, a more rigorous fasting routine, or to 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 strip myself away from this world for the sake of the Lord. I think of mm -hmm. the the rich young man, where you know he's like, "What good must I do to inherit eternal life?" And he already had a definition of what good was, right? Yeah. And yeah. so you know, Jesus starts to feed into his own de this guy's mm -hmm. definition mm -hmm. of, of what good is, and we'll follow the commandments. And he's like, "Well, I already follow the commandments, you know. Like, I'm right. already I'm already doing the good thing. Like, mm -hmm. I've already passed through the purgative phase. Yeah. You got that? Yeah. Now, how do I move on? Because I want <laughs> eternal life. I want beatific vision. I want." And and he says, go sell mm -hmm. all that you have and give it to the poor. Yep. That it's going to cost you something. The the means to move out of illuminative into unitive is renunciation of this world and of yourself. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And the rich young man, he walked away sad because he didn't want to he didn't want to give up worldly comfort yep. for the sake of the lover. Right. And mm -hmm. I think the well, what good must I do to inherit eternal life? How do I move? On? How does my soul? Well, you, the soul only moves through, um, moves on through renunciation and through sacrifice. And for the rich young man, the Lord is saying, you actually have to actively renounce your possessions. And he didn't want to. Yeah. When there's something, there's something about that to realize as well that, that like, I think we can see other people in certain circumstances in life and suggest to ourselves that they have it better than us, but sufferings can come in a lot of forms. You know, I, I I'm not sure I'm so quick to want to be the wealthiest person in the world. Like the, that seems good on its face, but then you become that and the sufferings that are there are different than the sufferings of the poorest among us. But that's not to say they're not sufferings. And I, I think your, your original question on suffering was good, Dan. I, I've been reflecting on this a lot recently. I've even said it on the podcast. I gave an exhortation to the missionary body on it. But really what's been helping me in this season is, is a hope in God who is my healer, my savior, my redeemer, a hope in him that allows me to have faith in every moment of what he's capable of doing. So in the midst of suffering that has not yet been alleviated from me, I don't want to just accept it as like the ultimate good because God's allowing it. There's something about me that doesn't sit best with that because because there's a better reality at hand. Yeah, like there is a better reality at hand. Like th this fallen world is still fallen, and I'm experiencing the fallenness of it. And so I don't want to just tie my ship to that and say, "Oh, here we go." You know. Yeah. Instead, I'm wanting to find this delicate balance that has mystery in it, where I say. Lord, you can do whatever you want right now. You can do whatever you want. You can alleviate every suffering in my life right now. You could heal this person right now. You can heal me right now. You can alleviate me from this um, past wound right now. And in the case that you don't, I know it's only gonna be better later. Yep. Those don't have to be divorced. 
And it can be lived every moment, that every moment I can be so wide-eyed to see that Jesus can break through right now and so excited for that and also not lose my faith if he doesn't because all he's telling me is, you just wait, you know? And that's that's amazing. Like that actually gives me good news every day that like, uh, yeah, I I think there is something about the unitive phase that it's the perfection of that understanding. It's the perfection of you're right here with me and and I love you so much and I'm so excited for what you're doing. But at the end of the day, me being with you forever, that's the alleviation of all this anyway. So anyway, I think that that gives where I've been at with it, but I think it, it, it would be really helpful for us in the church to not attach our ship to either or where it's, it's suffering and hell all the way to heaven, or it's <laughs> temporal healing and everything's going to be good right now, or you don't have enough faith. Yeah, it's, it's like, not. It's no, not the both pure suffering gospel or the no, prosperity gospel. No, it's yeah. it's a providential gospel. Yeah. It's not a. It's, the gospel is not truly an a poverty gospel, and it's not truly a um, prosperity gospel. It's a providence gospel. It's a you have what you need, mm-hmm. and what you want, which is ultimately me, will come in due time, in due season, yeah. as I reveal it. So what do I, I think to wrap this up, especially with this idea of beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission Mm -hmm. is that um, it's so beautiful that we can, we can actually be more effective at mission when we understand that it's through the cross that I find Christ, right? That, Mm -hmm. that perhaps what I've been running away from, maybe the, the call of the Lord on my life to do something self-sacrificial or the, the call of the Lord of my life to, to go out and, and to have this conversation with these, these opportunities that I run away from out of fear, I'm actually just protecting myself. And why, why do you follow Jesus, right? Do you follow him for his own sake? Because no matter what happens, no matter if Paul was, you know, converting a thousand people or if he was in prison, the mm-hmm. Lord was there and mm-hmm. it's through the cross that we find him. And, and, it, it empowers us to do whatever he tells us to do because I know that whatever comes, whether it's the glory of God or or the cross of Christ, I'm gonna I'm gonna find him there. And so well, let's close in prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just want hearts that want you. In whatever way we're able to in this earthly life, we want to pursue you for you. We don't want to pursue you for the status we get or for the consolation we get. We want you. We want to love you. We want to know you. We want to be with you. So Lord, just anything in us that's not of you, we pray that you would burn it away from our hearts. That increase the depth of our love. Mm -hmm. Uh, Give us words. Give us uh, moments to experience life with you. I pray especially for anybody who's listening today who has felt that uh, stagnant reality in their relationship with you. Mm-hmm. That you would that you would introduce a new taste, mm-hmm. Lord, of what of what deeper connection might be. Mm-hmm. And Lord, even more than you've expanded our minds today, as we think through these concepts, we pray that you would expand our hearts. That we want greater capacity to receive you as you are. So take our old wine skins and remove them from us and provide us new wineskins that they can hold the new wine that you want to give us, that new life source so that we can live closer with you every day. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks so much. You've been listening to Beyond Damascus, a show where encounter meets mission. We want to thank our partner uh, for this podcast, St. Gabriel Radio. And uh, we want to encourage you really to share this message with others. Uh, if there's people in your life who you think have imperfect love, send this their way. No, just kidding. Uh, but yeah, like, share, comment, do whatever. Um, more, most importantly, I hope we opened a can of worms in your spiritual life and you can really start wrestling with your own heart's motives. Um, yeah. And you can allow the Lord to not only transform your exterior life, but you can allow him to transform your interior life as well. Uh, join us next week on Beyond Damascus.